Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Jam Session on Channel 33, part of the Ringer Podcast Network, from my office roommate, Juliet Littman, and my office homie, Amanda Dobbins. Yes. Tune in as they examine the gossip industry, discussing celebrity news, pop culture scandals, and the business of being very famous. Incredible Jam Session episode this week, breaking down the Taylor Swift snake release. Can I just say, like, how lucky the people are to be able to have this podcast in their yeah. lives? I consider myself fortunate whenever I get to have a conversation with one of those yeah. two women. Yeah, now you get two, and you can just, you can hit pause. You can speed up Amanda's voice if you want to. I would never do Or that. slow it down. How dare you? It's a however you want to do it. Subscribe and listen to Jam Session on Channel 33, available on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get those podcasts. I need supports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, we are working on his origin story. It's Andy Greenwald! Oh, it would begin in darkness and it would end in darkness. Chris, we're talking to each other today on, on Thursday. Last night, we were uh, live. Talk the Thrones live at Largo. Yeah. With our binge mode pals, Jason and Mal. Yep. With special guest Shay Serrano. Big hit. With special guest Jason Manzoukas. Yep. Always number one in our hearts, if not on the call sheet, because that was you this time. Yeah. And you <laughs> earned it. Thanks. And in some ways, MVP, Yvonne Orgy from Insecure. Terrific. Ter- I, I really enjoyed she, sitting next to her. She was uh, hilarious. She, I liked it when she pawed you like a bear cub. Yes. Um, and then Manzoukas called me a eunuch. He did. <laughs> I, I feel like we're being cruel because... People are asking, this is not going to be available as a podcast. It is going to be dribbled out in video form. Yeah. People will see some of it. Um, And we would love to come to a town near you. Yeah. uh, Hopefully in the near future. We could use Hotel Tonight to stay in those towns. Sure. Uh, I believe. Felix Gray glasses to be able to see our (laughs) reservations on our phones. I mean, everything's coming together. uh, I I just want to thank everyone who did come out, was able to come out to Largo last night. It was a lot of fun. Um, I'll say to everyone here what we said to them. Thanks for being a part of this Thrones journey all year. I also just want to say to you, Chris, um, you did a terrific job last night. Thanks, man. And I, especially because... You were dynamite, too. You're kind of like, you're probably the John Gruden of Thrones. Because I say (laughs) obvious things during action Because you have enthusiasm for the form. Oh, yeah. Well, look, it was a lot of fun. Um, I just wanted to say, people don't realize this. The role you play as MC slash punching bag. It's it's it's, it's a new. It, it's interesting. I like to, I th- like to think I have a sense of humor about myself. I, I that certainly gets tested. I mean, you did some accent work that was brushed back. Yeah, like a Chris, little hiding Chris, inside. Chris did a Scottish accent. Uh, I was trying to do Jon Snow, which yeah. is why it was stupid, and I just did like I couldn't quite think of how to do a northern. Uh, English accent. Yeah. So you went full Scottish yeah. and uh, Manzoukas accused you of doing a fat bastard accent yeah. from Austin Powers. But you were terrific. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious because, because, because you know, the other people know all the stuff about the stuff. We don't. Yeah. And so we sort of have to roll with it. Um, we are going to talk a little bit about Thrones today, right? Yeah, we should we, say that we, the last talk of the Thrones is on Sunday after the extended finale. It's yeah. a, I think it's 80 minutes. Something like that. A very, pretty long finale. I, I, people have been asking, though... Uh, where's our Twin Peaks talk? And I want to let people know that there will be a considerable amount of Twin Peaks talk on this podcast. Yeah, second half of the pod. Second half of the pod, I will be speaking to David Nevins, the president of Showtime. You're hammering the table. You're like uh, emphatically at the pulpit. I just need people to... I'm Khrushchev with this. <laughs> um, and I'm going to talk to David Nevins about the whole gestation of Twin Peaks The Return, uh, how he made this happen, how he greenlit it, how he feels about the result. I'm excited about that conversation. Also... Chris, like the, if people are wondering why we don't do more live shows, it's because you and I in our aging White Walker bodies, we feel – I feel rough today. I feel I feel like the Pilsner or Kell was, was – something was in that last night. Yeah. I only had two and I'm feeling a little bit foamy today. Someone put some milk of the poppy in I my sometimes Guinness. Sometimes like with Pilsners, I don't know. Sometimes with Pilsners. Beer talk. <laughs> I, I think like I might just become like a straight – I don't know. I sometimes look like flowery pilsners. I just get a little weird. Yeah? Yeah. You know? Well, you're wearing it well today, and we're going to power through this with some great cultural talk. Yeah. Well, we have a couple of things we want to hit. We'll do a little bit of chat about Thrones in a minute. But I wanted to talk a little bit. Well, first of all, I do want to say one thing. Uh, tomorrow, so today's Thursday. I think either tonight or tomorrow, yeah. HBO Go will be releasing the pilot, the first episode of The Deuce. 
Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's great. We have an incredible... I mean, I think we're obviously like just such huge super fans, but we did a really, really cool conversation with George Pelicanos a couple weeks back that we'll be releasing, I think, next week. Yeah, because if if this is true, and you and I have the inside track with HBO Go, we are we were once their marquee sure. brand. Yeah, um, people will be able to watch the pilot. We didn't spoil it in our conversation. With no, George, not at all. Not but at all. I think people will be ready to hear more about it. It's a unique kind of pilot. It's almost like more like a movie. Yeah, directed by Michelle McLaren. It's directed by Michelle McLaren, and it, and the pilot is. Uh, it kind of almost reminds me of the way some shows used to introduce series in this sort of mega format. And it's, it's a rather long pilot. I think it's like it's almost 90 minutes, yeah, right? Yeah, it, it's also great. And it is phenomenal. Uh, if you feel like there's some voice in the back of your head or some itch you can't scratch that is basically that, that wire itch, you know, I, I think that this show has some of the best parts of the last 20 years of Simon's it, work, of yeah. Richard Price's work, of Pelicanos' work, it, uh, it, Michelle it, McLaren's work. And I know I'm really excited to see episodes written by Megan Abbott. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's just like, it's such a cool, cool thing. It is an all star operation. Um, but it's really worth noting, it looks phenomenal. Yeah. Not just because of Michelle McLaren, but because of you know, the way that they, using CGI and careful production design, like recreated 70s New York City. Early 70s New York, yeah. Um, it's it, it's also, and this is a really nice thing, and, and we spoke to George about this, but it's like a nice mashup of David Simon's seriousness of purpose and journalistic integrity that he brings to the television shows he does. And as Pelicanos told us, it's a little bit of fun, too. It's a little bit of pulp. It's a little bit of flash. And it's a nice combination. We are all in on this show. Should we announce our Double Down Book Club, then? Exactly that. Okay, yeah. so we have George coming on the show. Uh, we talked a little bit about this with him. Uh, but we wanted to announce the new Double Down Book Club title, which is sort of coinciding with the release of The Deuce. It's not a New York novel. It's not a 70s novel. It's not a 70s Although novel. Although he has one of those called King Sucker Man. King Sucker Man, which I think had a lot of influence on this show. But for me and Andy, this is one of our favorite Pelicanos titles. It was definitely the one that kind of unlocked uh, him for me. And it's a novel Both called uh, The Sweet Forever. And it is um, basically a crime novel set in D.C. during March Madness during the, the final NCAA tournament of Len Bias, and it tells just like a really classic uh, crime story about a bag of money and two guys trying to make the right choices while also battling some demons, and it's just an incredible read. There is like a lot of 80s music mixed into yeah. it, which is one of my favorite parts about it, but basically it starts out with a car crash, and you know everything goes wrong from there. Um, we were really excited for you guys to check it out. We will because try to be very attentive when it comes to letting you guys know when we're going to discuss the book in full, but yeah. we'll do it some point during the deuce season. Yeah, we're excited to do that. Hopefully we might even be able to get George to weigh in, and in on it again or some special guests. But people ask us a lot now that we're doing this book club. Well, they ask us, when are we going to have a new entry? This is it. Yeah. But how we got into, why we got into, where we got into crime fiction, for both of us, at least on, our, on the journey we went on together, this book was kind of the touchstone for a lot of it. Uh, both of us read this early in our reading of Pelicanos, and then we went on to read everything he wrote. Yeah. And for me, I, I hadn't read Lahane when I read this. I hadn't read Richard Price. I went from there. This is a great entry point. It's a riveting book. If it's the only one you read, fine, but it, it might just cause a problem. Yeah, we often talk about the reason why we get so into these books, the sort of the reason why we do this book club in general, is that um, the, the sort of crime umbrella that these fall under – the crimes are just an excuse to have like a snapshot of a certain kind of world. And I don't know, there there are very few books in this genre better at Sweet Forever than sort of painting a picture of the way people listen to music, the way yeah. they talk at bars, the way they get high, the way they come down. It is incredible the way, and it, it's just like, yes, there is a there is a crime sort of or a, a thriller aspect to it, but it's really just about a, a spring in D.C., and it's pretty incredible. Yeah, and I think it'll be really interesting, too, for listeners out there who are younger than us, um, the names and locations and um, uh, the specifics of this book yeah, right. might be things that you know in passing. Punk rock or new wave and right, basketball there's, players. There's and, punk rock and new wave and Len Bias and DC's particular role as uh, quote unquote chocolate city. Sure. Um, and its role in music and sports and the very specific culture of the city that Pelicanos grew up in that he told us in our interview is mostly gone now. And he says it's not all for the bad that it's gone now, but it was a very different place then. And uh, th this is how I like to get my history. Yeah, so this is a uh, new Double Down Book Club title is Sweet Forever by George Pelicanos. We can tweet out a link to where to find that. 
Uh, want to talk about Thrones really quickly. I just wanted to get your reaction about the sort of bigger movie news that came out this week, which is that Warner Brothers and DC, this is from Deadline, are in the early stages of another Batman Universe spinoff, this mm-hmm. one telling the origin story of the signature villain, the Joker. Mm-hmm. Here is the behind-the-scenes crew working on this. Yeah. The Hangover's Todd Phillips will co-write the script with 8 Mile scribe Scott Silver. Phillips will direct the movie. Great. And Martin Scorsese will produce it. Terrific. That's a so murderer's row. The, uh, the implication here, or the, what they're saying, is that the intention is to make a gritty and grounded hard-boiled crime film set in the early 80s Gotham City, and it isn't meant to feel like a DC movie as much as one of Scorsese's films from that era, like Taxi Driver, sure. Raging Bull, or The King of Comedy. Definitely. I love to talk with uh, Sam Donsky about this idea of director bullshit, mm-hmm. where like when they're leading up to yeah, yeah. what essentially, like it's like a Planet of the Apes movie or whatever, and they're like, well, what were you sort of thinking about when you were making this movie? Like, David Lean. It's Here's, like, okay, dog. But it's true. Here's the thing. <laughs> to work in this industry, certainly on that level, you have to lie to yourself a lot. Yeah. Now, you also go to sleep on a bed literally made of money. So it's I'm not asking you to break out the violins. But you have to find a way to jimmy together a connection between yes. the garbage pile that is hiding that money yeah. and the art that inspired you in the first place. So Absolutely. And we got this with, like, Kong Skull Island, right, where Jordan Vogt Roberts was like, I wanted to make Apocalypse Now. Sure. And Good. And, and Matt Reeves has been, ta- been referencing Hitchcock for the right. Batman movie he's making. So, sure. And, you know, and, I, and I'm not trying to—I'm I, I, a big fan of Sam Donsky's tweets on this subject, so I'm not trying to get on his back about it. But, I mean, sometimes it works. Now— It's interesting, though, does it? Like, does well, not, anybody it, not ever, in like, I think what things. it does is—I've been thinking about this a lot with, like, how— Within a small circle of people who sort of regularly read about the production and marketing of movies, right. which I, I, I can't, it's, it's big enough so that that is in itself an industry. There are choices that people make when they decide to start pushing out narratives about a film. Now, I mean, you can read between the lines on this deadline thing, and it's like, it kind of sounds like Todd Phillips wanted to make a king of comedy style, awkward 80s New York movie, yep. which... I actually don't think it would be that bad. No. And that they, whether or not this was a union of that, or maybe he went and said, hey, I want to make the Joker movie, but I want to make it as King of Comedy or something. Well, because what Warner Brothers is claiming, and I really have a lot of skepticism about this, is that they are going to take a page from Fox's management of their X-Men properties, basically, mm-hmm. and say, we're going to just not be so concerned about continuity. Yes. We're going to let th- some things be funny, some things be And there weird. were some questions this week about the Batman movie, about that maybe being outside Abs- of this just- quagmire of Justice right, League. Right, so they can yeah. cast someone else and make their own thing. Because, correctly, audiences don't really care that much. Yeah. They, they'll, they'll see a Batman movie if it's a good Batman movie. So, okay, sure. But, you know, it, I, I, I was th- your point about director bullshit, think about an, exa- an example where it did work is Stranger Things, which we're going to be talking about a lot this fall. If you had asked the Duffer brothers what they were inspired by, you know, they would name the Spielberg movies and, and Goonies yeah. and Carpenter and, and and they did that. They channeled that. Now, they channeled it into what – which is a, an original creation. It's mm-hmm. obviously kind of a Frankenstein of all those elements. The problems start to become – and this is your favorite hobby horse, but I'm going to jump on it and ride, man. Go for it. Uh, when people are like Captain America Winter Soldier is the parallax view. Yeah, right. It's not. Right. Um, it's cool that they mentioned that. <laughs> yes. I like the parallax yes. view, and I like Winter Soldier, but it's not. The, for me, the weirder thing about it, which of course isn't weird, but it still is like cause people to do a little double or triple take here, is the Scorsese part. And look, here's the thing: Martin Scorsese, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, a genius, will should and and will be able to make movies for the rest of his life. Yes, it may be a very long one, but I believe he makes his movies usually through Warner Brothers, and this is part of it, business now. If he wants to be in business, I mean, he can go to Amazon or Netflix and they'll bankroll anything. But and Netflix is bank, bankrolling the Irishman to the tune of $150 million. That's right. Yeah. So that's right. So, but if he wants to be in business with Warner Brothers, now I, I know I'm going to get some of the specifics wrong here, but, you know, this dude made silence, right? Yeah. I don't, and, know, I don't, I don't know who, I, I know that he had to work very hard on the funding for that by patching it together but, across uh, but, countries. But the thing about Scorsese is for at this point in his career, for every, and this is, again, this is a great thing, for every Wolf of Wall Street or Departed that he makes, he makes Kundun, mm-hmm. you know, or um, Silence or, 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 or more of a personal passion project. This is one of the, this is one for them, one for me, I think, on some level. I mean, first of all, he's going to have nothing to do with this. 
he he will maybe get paid for it or he can throw his name on it. He's not going to have anything to do with it. I think it. The, the charitable reading of this, and it's probably pretty close to it, is that like Martin Scorsese is a guy who has like a lot of interest in terms of film restoration and film preservation and getting behind – Obscure, more obscure filmmakers like he did the Ben. He produced the Ben or executive produced the Ben Wheatley movie yeah, from earlier this right. year. So if there is like a movement of funds, and also it's just like I'm sure this is a nice paycheck, and maybe he's actually genuinely interested in seeing if he can make a subversive '80s thriller with uh, or '80s movie with Todd Phillips about the Joker. It, it, I, they're not going to cast Jared Leto. I just want, want really quickly. I wanted to ask you. It's not only just director bullshit where they're like, oh, I'm going to make this movie. It's it's influenced by Godard, and it's mm-hmm. actually just Transformers last night. It's also, it was very interesting. I saw it, Logan Lucky earlier this week. I'm jealous. Really, really liked it. Oh, I want to see it. I really liked it. Let me tell you something. Movies are good. Yeah. Steven Soderbergh makes good movies. Yeah, he does. I like heist movies. Yes, me too. Is, I love everything you're saying. I'm excited. And if you're ever like, this is getting a little dull, or you know, maybe this isn't like setting my... My hair on fire. Yeah. Guess what? It ends. It's over in two hours. Terrific. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about this, though, is that the thing that most people seem to know about Logan Lucky is that it is Steven Soderbergh's attempt to disrupt film distribution. Love disruption. And that it was all this like this idea that he was going to use this company fingerprint. I think it's called Zach B has Zach Baron has like a great uh, not only a feature on Steven Mm -hmm. Soderbergh in GQ, but he also has this very long the transcripts of his interviews with him were posted on GQ.com, and you should really read them yeah, because Zach wrote a great very, piece. But this Q and A's are great. Yeah, and he right goes very in depth about how they're going to sell the they're going to sell the negative to pay for this, and they're your you know non U or non traditional p- distribution pays for that, mm-hmm. and everything is profit. So he made like eight million or something. Not it was essentially a bomb, I guess, mm-hmm. at the box office, especially considering the Channing Tatum and Kylo Ren are in it, mm-hmm. and James Bond. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the narrative became entirely about, like, well, was this a success or a failure? And so is pretty sarcastic about his film career right now. He's like, I'm not going to make serious movies. I'm yeah, going to make serious TV. Yeah. The films are just going to basically be, like, experiments and fun. Yeah, he, he shot a horror movie for 10 days with Claire Foy, right? Yeah, on an I, like, reportedly on an iPhone. I bet yeah. it's probably a little more complicated than that. But It's probably a Samsung Galaxy. Did, would it have helped yeah. if you knew more, if, like, the Logan Lucky trailer... And what you knew about Logan Lucky was more than the distribution model that it was following. Well, I, I, I mean, think for you, I guess, it, I mean, I'm saying in general, like, he, I would love to hear from people about this. People don't, no one in Hollywood knows how to get their story across anymore. They know how to get things made. They know how to get things funded. And they know how to put them on your screen. And they know, you know, going, if you look at the very high end of Game of Thrones, you look at the very, not low end, but a, a you know, a more cost effective end, like FX's Louis comedies, Louis or better things. Mm-hmm. They know how to do things on a more limited budget. What they don't know how to do is get you to understand what it is, what they're trying to do. You know, we there used to be a lot of angst about the Hollywood only greenlighting movies that you could understand in the trailer. Yeah, and then it became the, the poster. Pitch, yeah. Now it's the the tweet or the image, you know, and even that isn't enough. I mean, so your your question to me is I don't know what more they could do. The Logan Lucky trailer was incredible. The poster I understood the vibe, mm-hmm. you know. What more can they do to get you in the theater? And I, I don't really know. It's it's hard to tell what will spark interest. You know, you're ask, when when you ask me that question, I'm thinking also about the stuff that came out this week about how MTV is like going all in on TRL mm-hmm. and p- pumping up the VMAs again, and they're going to have like Snapchat and like hologram engagement. And I'm like, just you're just saying nonsense words. Like I don't understand what that will do for you, but they're trying. Yeah, so I, I, I think I think. I, I think a lot of that is, is is the difficulty. They're making all this stuff and they're funding all this stuff, but they really don't know what's going to hit or what what's not going to hit. And unless it's a company that's really just trying to boost its bottom, not it, its bottom line. Well, first of all, its bottom line with shareholders, but also its library, then then I don't know. I don't know. You know, because if these companies are still broadcast networks are still on some level dependent on the overnight ratings. Um, movie studios are still dependent on opening. I mean, less and less, but on the box office. Yeah. Meanwhile, as we talk about often, Netflix and Amazon are like, cool. Whatever, yeah. I'll give, I'll give Steven Soderbergh and Martin Scorsese and um, Ellen DeGeneres or uh, Shonda Rhimes, I'm just throwing names out who, who make a lot of money. I'll just give them $300 million. My shareholders are happy and we have that now. Yeah. So it's just, it's a very mixed playing field. All of that, I said, because I thought you were going to ask me, would I have liked, would I have been more psyched about Logan Lucky if I knew it was low-key a Harley Quinn origin story? <laughs> But this is the world we've made. Yeah. You know? I know. 
So they're going to make a Joker origin story, but they're also going to make a Joker Harley Quinn romance movie. And they'll make Justice League. I mean, they're just going to, oh, let's end on this note. They're also probably not going to make a lot of this, you know? Yeah, I know. A lot of this. Um, Before we go, I want to get to your interview with David Nevins really quickly. Um, Did you ever think we were going to be in day four of Are We Sure Thrones is Good Conversation? Oh, yeah, we didn't even talk about Thrones. Uh, I mean, we have it coming up Sunday. Last episode of Talk the Thrones after the last episode of Game of Thrones for the season will be on as soon as the East Coast airing is over. Yep. Uh, just the four of us this week. It's, it's really weird. I mean, our, at our event last night, we on the stage talked about this, and people in the audience seemed to share our concerns here. I would say it was like 85% people in the crowd. And, I mean, no like, one is yeah, like, what's up with this? Let's all remember this. Let's measure our tone here. No one is out on this show. No, not at but all. But I think we were all really thrown thrown by last week because it was off-key in a way the show hadn't been before. I mean, there were things that didn't work, certainly, like Dorn, like sexual politics, like the time there was a bear fight. You know, it's just they've had misfires creatively or in, in any number of directions. But this was the first one where I was like, wait, where are we going? I think the stress comes from the lack of permutations available. So – People are stressed out about them screwing it up because they can only really do one yeah. of three things. And if they're right, like, you can't really miss on two of them, you know. And I think that people are feeling for the first time this always felt like the safest investment on television. Mm-hmm. No, the history of television because they were on a track. So you could go on this journey and it would be worth the quote unquote worth the investment. I don't like that phrasing, but that's really how people I watch TV yeah. now. We have six plus years now sunk into these characters and these relationships. And if one of them were to die on a nonsense mission to rescue a zombie, it would feel cheap and horrifying. Yeah. And similarly, if the end result of this ridiculous mission to convince Cersei is going gonna, is gonna to result in the deaths of, I don't know, Jamie or Brienne or, I don't know, other characters that we care about on some level, it's going to be – unless they do some masterful scene work, it's going to be hard not to have that little – Acrid taste in yeah. mouth, right? Yeah, I think I agree with you. We'll have to see what happens on Sunday night. Here is Andy's interview with Showtime President David Nevins coming shortly after a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode of The Watch is brought to you by Hotel Tonight. If you're like me, Andy, and you're not so great at planning ahead, I've got good news for you, but really for me, because I'm the one who's not so great at planning ahead. There's this awesome app called Hotel Tonight that helps you find amazing hotel deals at the last minute. It sounds counterintuitive, but unlike flights, hotel rates usually get cheaper at the last minute. And Hotel Tonight helps hotels sell their unsold rooms, allowing them to pass those deals along to you. And these are not last resort places. They are actually cool, top-rated hotels that you really want to stay in. And with so many awesome partner hotels in a ton of different countries, Hotel Tonight can help you find a great hotel almost anywhere. It's perfect for a spontaneous getaway or finally going on that trip that you've been wanting to take for a while. Greenwald, I'm turning the big 4-0 soon. I'm really excited for this. I, I, I would love I, I for my 40th birthday to be sponsored by Hotel Tonight, in which I get to take a tour of all my bucket list locations across the globe. Can I come? Yes. Thank you. That's, that's just a little subliminal messaging to our homies at Hotel Tonight. Look, it doesn't even need to be that big of a deal. Just getting out of town for a weekend and it's sort of spontaneous trip or something that you plan a little bit ahead and about a week in advance anything you want to do hotel tonight's name is hotel tonight but you can book up to a week in advance that's the cool thing about it you get a little bit of timing in there all it takes is 10 seconds just three taps and a swipe so get in on these killer last minute deals and download the hotel tonight app now today's episode of the watch is also brought to you by felix gray Think about how often you look at screens. You might be looking at a screen right now. You're staring at the watch logo on your iPhone screen, or maybe you're listening to us, you're looking at your TV screen, you're looking at your computer screen, or you might be listening to the podcast to get away from one. So you know all about that eye rub moment when your eyes feel dry and fatigued, you have a headache, your vision goes blurry. Your eyes deserve a break. So give them one with a pair of computer glasses from Felix Gray. Felix Gray's lenses are specially designed to filter blue light and eliminate glare, which many of us know are the two culprits behind digital eye strain. You probably know by now that too much blue light from your computer and phone screen can lead to eye strain and make it hard to focus. Felix Gray glasses have blue light filtering material actually embedded in the lens so that they remain effective without that ugly yellow tint or color distortion that other computer glasses have. Felix Gray eyewear is beautifully crafted from premium handmade Italian acetate. Their glasses look so great, you can feel confident in any work environment. I happen to have the Turing's. I love them. They're lovely frames. I'm I'm very fond of those, but there are a bunch of really great frames on their site. All orders are free shipping and free returns, so there's really no risk in trying them out. Available in both non-prescription and reading lenses, but I hear prescription is coming soon. Give your eyes the break they deserve 
Go to FelixGrayGlasses.com. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y Glasses.com slash watch today to try a p- pair of Felix Gray computer glasses and discover a smarter way to work. That's FelixGrayGlasses.com slash watch. FelixGrayGlasses.com slash watch. I am extremely excited to be joined now on the line um, from his office out here somewhere in Los Angeles, uh, the CEO and president of Showtime Network, David Nevins. Welcome back to the podcast. Happy to be here. Uh, uh, and, and to answer your, your, your implied question, coming to you from greater downtown Westwood, greater the shadow <laughs> of UCLA. Greater downtown Westwood. I didn't realize downtown Westwood uh, merited um, that sort of distinction. Is there, yes. there's, there's major downtown Westwood, minor downtown Westwood? And so on. Yeah, well, you know, Westwood is is, is sort of a uh, mecca um, for college students around the country who want to come to UCLA. So that's that's here true. I am. Well, <laughs> it's, it, it's one way to stay young, David. I'm so happy that you could join us because uh, you are um, one of the chief people chiefly responsible for making me happier than just about anything, making me happier than just about anyone else in the world because you brought Twin Peaks back, and I don't know if we've discussed this in previous conversations, but Twin Peaks was my first favorite show of all time. It is probably remains my favorite <laughs> show of all time. There are pictures of me dressed as Special Agent Dale Cooper holding a coffee mug, even though I was 12 or 13 and couldn't really drink coffee. Um, I never thought this The question would... <laughs> is, will you put together a costume for Dougie? Well, uh, of course. I, I think, you know, as, as one ages, I think maybe the original Dougie is probably more appropriate, but not, uh-huh. not, the, not, not the ripped Cooper Dougie. So the, uh, the first... I mean, isn't just a, the first. It's not even a question. It's just I just wanted to say thank you for doing this. You've brought me. This yeah. show has brought me so much joy uh, in its return. You are very welcome, and uh, it is an honor to be able to uh, satisfy um, you know the the yearnings of of millions of Twin Peaks fans. I have to bring it all the way back to the beginning and ask you how this actually happened, because up until the minute the music started playing on my TV a few months ago, I really didn't believe this. I just didn't let my heart get carried away. I just couldn't see how this could be. It seems so unlikely, and I know there were some bumps along the way. So mm-hmm. if you don't mind, take us back a few years. Was this something that you sought out from your perch at Showtime, or were, or was David and Mark uh, actively shopping this around to because they had the, they had the notion and they had the, the, the inclination to do it? Well, as with all Twin Peaks, all things Twin Peaks was a little bit more murky than either of those two. The truth is, I had heard rumors that they were thinking and that there might be conversation. I had never met uh, David Lynch. I did know Mark Frost. I wasn't in, close, in any kind of close contact with him. But we would heard rumors that they were thinking about it and they were having conversations with each other. And uh, that led to a sort of reach out and an invitation to the two of them to, uh, you know, uh, come to our offices in greater downtown <laughs> Burbank. And uh, um, and they came in and uh, sat on my couch with uh, Gary Levine, who David knew from the ABC days. Gary Levine was the head of drama at ABC when... Uh, when Twin Peaks was first developed. And I think it was an opportunity for David to check us out and to check out how he felt about us as potential, um, potential partners. And by the time they came in, it was clear that the rumors were true and that they had been talking about it and had been thinking about it. Um, but they were still a little vague in what their plans were. So the first meeting was, was really just a, um, a feel out meeting and you know I was trying to convince them that they should this would be this would be a good a good home for their baby so in that first meeting there was no discussion of resurrecting the little man from another place as a talking electric tree that you weren't there yet nope we're not we were we were not at that point yet um, that was um, never discussed although it was reflected in the script pages that they that they eventually delivered um, before uh, before going into production, so it's not like it was completely sprung on us, but uh, um, you know, because I think pretty much what what they've shot is what was was reflected in that script with some with some alterations, but mostly uh, 
um, most most everything was in the script. Were there subsequent meetings before any script stage in which they they pitched you on the general tenor of the return, what it you know the what the characters that they wanted to bring back, their arcs, um, or did or was it still murky until you actually saw uh, pages? Yeah, I don't remember any. I don't remember any detailed where let us let us pitch to you, let us lay out for you. Um, uh, they talked about the idea of wanting to provide satisfaction, wanting to provide closure. They talked about some of their desire to uh, go back to some of the same characters. So I always knew there would be some degree mm-hmm. of uh, revisiting characters and and uh, and and some degree of newness. And and we talked about the fact that. This was, you know, not not a remaker, and it's the same characters twenty five years later. So those basic um, uh, story that that basic story point of view, uh, those those basic story tenants were discussed, but really none of the specifics. Um, and I think they showed us the script first. First, there was um, the opening two hours, and mm-hmm. then uh, and then there was the whole thing. So when you saw those first two hours, I imagine you had uh, some of the questions that the audience did ended up having as well, such as the lack of, not the lack of, but the expansion of the palette. Um, the first mm-hmm. the first series obviously was called Twin Peaks, and it was pretty much set in Twin Peaks. The movie expanded it out a little bit, and obviously the movie mm-hmm. came to hold a lot of significance for the series um, that followed. But uh, the, the two hours... That 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 dropped earlier this summer. I mean, we're we're in Las Vegas. We're in New York City. There's a glass box. It's it was for me. It was head spinning and delirious in all the best possible ways. But I'm wondering what that was like. Um, I in your um, office. I think I saw in the first two hours. I pretty much saw all the locations of the show. Yeah. It, um, I That's saw true. it was life in Twin Peaks, life in Vegas, New York City, South Dakota. Yep. Um, and I don't. Uh, I don't want to say too much because I don't want to presume that people said it. There's, there's one more location that kind of comes in, as you, as you know by now, if you're up to speed. Mm-hmm. Um, but those those initial um, strands, uh, New York, South Dakota, Vegas, um, Washington, um, Twin Peaks, Washington, um, we're, all, we're all there. And, uh, and on the page, it all you know. I sort of understood that that these these stories were related, and I didn't yet know how they were related. But it was very exciting. And I believe, and I don't know if this was accurately reported in the press at the time, but the initial uh, order was for something short. It was it, it was imagined as something like eight to nine episodes. And what I understand is this was the script they wrote for eight to nine episodes. It just couldn't be mm-hmm. contained. Is that is that accurate? Yes, it is. It is, and that was where you know the the that. The, the one breakdown yeah. uh, that happened while I, I was actually out of the country, and we 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 fixed it really within more or less within 24 hours of me landing because I went and saw David was was over that was over. Wait a second, uh, you showed me what what appears to be uh, I think nine hours of scripts, or maybe it was maybe it was 11 hours of scripts. Why does it need to be so much longer? Um, and, uh, and I didn't, you know, in the conventional way of TV thinking, I was right, you know, um, but in the way that David works, um, it was sort of an arbitrary, silly question. Um, and, uh, these are the pages I'm going to do them the way I want to. And there were some little things that he added along the way, but mostly they were. And he said, um, and I, when I said I realized what the issue was, I said, all right, well, there's a finite amount of money. Here's this amount of money, and uh, you determine it, but you just got to promise me that you're going to shoot the whole script. We're not, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to end up halfway through the scripts um, and run out of money. And he promised me, and he completely lived up to the promise, and he didn't, um, you know, he's an incredibly responsible filmmaker. Mm-hmm. Um and responsible producer, and uh, and that's how it worked out. Yeah, I think but once I realized, I once I realized that like um, he wasn't, it wasn't really like he was asking for double the money, uh, or you know, seventeen uh, seventeen tenths more. You know, he was just asking uh, 
not to be held to a, a conventional TV budget structure, and and uh, and he completely lived up to it. He can't be he can't be withheld by conventions in any any category or medium. Um, That's right. For, for people who don't know that there was a brief period during the long gestation of this project after it had been announced that it appeared to be on the brink of falling apart that that. David Lynch was perhaps leaving the project, which you know I think, as any fan would agree, would have imperiled the whole thing. I, I he actually, was very, even even in even in leaving, he was incredibly gracious because he didn't say Twin Peaks isn't going. He just said, "Well, maybe they'll be doing Twin Peaks without me." And I was like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let me come see you. <laughs> yeah. I have no interest in doing Twin Peaks without him." I don't think we have any so, interest in seeing uh, it. It's impossible to imagine. Actually, I did say at the beginning that I didn't believe any of this, but the one thing that I, I I actually did have weird optimism then because that that would work out because I think at that point, um, though you hadn't obviously shot anything yet, you that you had sent TV critics a cherry pie that December um, yes. to celebrate it, and I said, well, they you know I I don't know how many cherry pies they sent, but they're not good. that's not recoupable, so they definitely are going to make the show. <laughs> well, so much of my job through this through this you know the long period of you know from first words slipping out into the universe, the Twin Peaks could come back to it actually coming was my job was to make the, um, make the lovers not lose heart, you know? Um, so, uh, the, the, the Christmas present of cherry pies to the, the critics of America was part of that. Like, I know you're frustrated. I know you're skeptical. I know you believe it's never going to happen, but hang in there. You know, like it's going to be worth it in the end. And then as we started getting closer, it was, um, you know, where we're not showing any film really. We're we're being very, very spare on what we're saying, what we're doing. I'm not doing any of my usual, um, you know, hype tricks, Mm -hmm. um, was, was, to, but, but to make it feel real, like this is not a, you know, this is not an illusion. It's going to happen. How difficult was that? Because you're seeing, you're seeing images, you're, you're aware of the story. And I, I mean, whether, whether you, and I don't mean you, I mean the collective audience, you, whether you, you, you love it, whether you're baffled by it, you want to talk about this. You know, this yeah. is, this is, yeah. it, 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 much like the original part of the, the wonder and uniqueness of the show is, saying, what did I just see? How did that make me feel? How do I process this? And, I, I, you I, you're totally right. It. This show this show definitely rewards that. And then when you're talking, you know, in conversation, you discover things that you didn't think you realized. And, you know, the only good thing I can say is I had my own little posse. They're yeah. all my colleagues here at Showtime. Me, Gary Levine, Robin Gurney, the people who are reading and watching the show. And, um, you know, Mark Frost... David, I would talk at a couple times. He would never really talk back to me. Um, you know, uh, I would say, "Hey, what about?" and and he kind of grinned at me. Um, uh, so, but I, ha- I had, I had, I won't say there was no outlet for that desire for conversation. It it does sound like, and this is again, this is maybe not traditional in the in the way TV was when when you were coming up in the business, um, but is is more and more common now. It, it does seem like you guys empowered. Twin Peaks Incorporated to go off and produce this television show for and you And do guys. it their way. And do it their way, and then you were committed yeah. to letting them do that, and that's the the beauty of the show we have. However, there are certain things, and, and, and please be clear, I've said this at the beginning, I am in love with this show. So I this is, this is not me advocating mm-hmm. for this, but I am curious. Obviously, if this was in a more traditional framework, it wouldn't mm-hmm. have gotten made. But if you're going to continue the, 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 the hypothetical, mm-hmm. in the traditional framework, the fact that the star of the show, the star character, has yet to make an appearance other than, you know, being trapped in the first hour or so, that would be a, that would be a network note. Now, obviously, Kyle yeah. is giving the performance of the year in multiple roles, and it is astonishing mm-hmm. to watch. But, you know, ahead of this weekend's episode, where I think a lot of fans are anticipating something happening um, in, in regards to this, we haven't mm-hmm. seen Special Agent Dale Cooper back, and, and, and it's been a long time. It's been a lot of hours. You're right. And, uh, and it can, you know, that yearning, uh, that you're feeling, uh, that the fans are feeling, I feel the same, I feel the same yearning. I'm not, I'm not immune to it, but I understood that giving up power here was part of what was going to make it great and special. So, uh, that's just, um, it's just what it is. Did, did, did you ever, is that some, can I give you an analogy? Cause I know you were a Friday night lights fan. Yeah, I sure was. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll make a connection back to Friday night lights. 
I remember that Jason Kadem's first two scripts, we cross-boarded the first two scripts of episodes two and three of Friday Night Lights, mm-hmm. and there were certain scenes that I loved in the script, and then I'm watching dailies, and uh, the actors were not saying the lines in the script, and they were like completely going off and completely improv And it was really frustrating. You know, I've been sort of brought up in a culture where actors are supposed to say the lines that are written for them. And Pete Berg had set a slightly different dogma on the pilot, but Jason Kadams wasn't from that dogma. But Kadams, who had already kind of learned the right attitude, I think, from Pete Berg, said, Mm -hmm. whatever I give up in control, I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back more from the actors having to own what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's the trade-off of power. So by ceding power to David to hold out longer than I wanted him to on the, you know, what everyone wants is the return of Agent Cooper, you get back enormous things in terms of creativity and originality. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, clearly it's built to have you yearn in that direction. And uh, uh, And there's a reason why the author has chosen to hold back on you. Have, was that one of the things... Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Uh, and I appreciate yeah. the analogy to one of my favorite shows, other favorite shows. Um, did is No, but seriously, where the hell is Dale Cooper? Was that one of the questions you said to David that he just smiled at? Perhaps. <laughs> okay. You know, perhaps along the way. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not being coy. I'm not trying to be... I, do, I don't remember, but I remember the feeling. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't remember exactly what I said to David or not. And, you know, there was, there was a conversation after reading the scripts, and there was another conversation after watching the rough cuts. So, yeah, I mean, I know, I know the feeling. I mean, but, there, uh, there's something that is, 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 this is hard to, um, you know, capture in a, in, a, in a tweet or in a press release, but there is something that I find truly exhilarating about giving up to the show. Right. Giving up, you know. And that is, and that is the point. The one thing that David, you know, he wants you, he wants you to stop thinking and start feeling. He yes. wants he wants you to experience those feelings, and that is very clear about him as a uh, uh, as an artist. Um, that he's going to uh, defeat your desire to, to to create perfect narrative logic, and he's going to uh, um, uh, create a feeling. And so, those he has an amazing ability to create a feeling, and so part of those part of the feeling that he creates is by not giving in to your expectations. Yeah, and, and it's it's funny, you know, that there was a lot of talk about how the original Twin Peaks was nothing like what was on television at the time, and in a way it, it sort of presaged the, the, the smarter TV era of the last, of, the, of this century, let's say. But what's really refreshing and wonderful about this is that once again, Twin Peaks is completely ahead of its time and out of step with its times, because in this mm-hmm. era that we're in now, um, you know, you're, you're, you're talking, David, you're talking to someone who, you know, sp- spends the last seven weeks micromanaging every detail of every, and every reaction to Game of Thrones, you know, game plan, mm-hmm. predicting what's going to happen, you know, almost as mm-hmm. if it was, uh, um, as if it was sports. And now we have the show again that just, that absolutely defies us from doing that. And it's, right. it, it's, it's, inc- it's incredibly, it's moving. Uh, it's exciting. And I think you would be, um, you would be wise to look to, the new Twin Peaks as a peek into the future of where television is going, because I think uh, David is enormously influential on other storytellers. Mm-hmm. And uh, in the same way that the seeds of Sopranos and Game of Thrones and Breaking Bad and Mad and were, were there in the original Twin Peaks, yep. um, I think you're, you're seeing, you'll see in the, in, in the, uh, in the new Twin Peaks, you'll see spawn towards um, future trends I, in narrative. I, I love that you're saying that, and I, I'm glad that you did, because one thing that I've been trying to tell people is that during the run of Twin Peaks, the people who have been most unanimous and full-throated in their adoration of the show are incredibly successful showrunners. Um, right. You know, um, spoken to Sam Esmail about it. I've talked to Damon Lindelof about it. You know, they... Mm-hmm are considered the vanguard right. of what they do now. And they're saying, well, we bow to this, you know, and right. this, and I don't, I don't know exactly what the lessons are. You know, I'm, I'm paying very close attention both to twin peaks itself and to what Sam Esmail and, and, uh, Damon Lindelof and David Hollander are doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm paying very close attention to what they're doing. And I don't know what the lessons learned are, but you know, 
I think I'll recognize it when I see it. You know what I mean? Um, in terms of scripts that come back to me over the next few years. Well, I'm I'm curious about that specifically because obviously um, the metrics of what makes a success have changed radically in television. Um, in some ways, the Build up to the premiere of Twin Peaks was a um, throwback to the way things used to be, and that you know you get the Entertainment Weekly cover, and the fans get interviewed again, and you know people put cherry pie in the menu. But then we've settled into this, and obviously you know Game of Thrones came back, and this has been mm-hmm. you know we're 15 weeks or whatever we are into it. The mm-hmm. that kind of mainstream heat has dissipated, and I know the ratings, the mm-hmm. overnight ratings are are not you know like Game mm-hmm. of Thrones. Let's put it that way. But I'm curious for you as an executive who greenlit this. Um, what are you looking for and what are you looking at? And what does it say specifically about your job? Because, you know, I, I've joked, um, it, hopefully good-naturedly, that, you know, I, I love the split-screen ads on my browser for Twin Peaks and Ray Donovan because those are both mm-hmm. successful TV shows that I don't know how much DNA they share in some ways. You know, I, mm-hmm. I, I don't see it. But I love that they're both right. on your network. Um, right. And I, I think it's... You very point. rarely... I, I don't know... you. All I'm trying to think, we actually very rarely put them together. You're not seeing a ton of uh, split screen ads. Well, no, it's, um, it's, they, they, it's, they do run against each other. Yeah. One runs at eight o'clock, and one runs at nine o'clock. You are, I think, you're correct in what you say. Um, although they they um, have probably have a, a hair more overlap than you than than you would uh, yes. than you would I, imagine. I, I don't want to prejudge, but what I mean is, but um, me- metaphorically, they they are they. Uh, they're different. Twin Peaks is, is so other. <laughs> so, but I and, wonder, uh, so what is it? Go ahead. Is it, but, ask the but, question. But, but, but the question here is how much of, of putting on Twin Peaks, I mean, let's set aside the most important thing, which is that you uh, funded this incredible work of art that will last and has made so many people very happy. But setting that aside mm-hmm. in terms of your business pointing forward in a very exciting but also tumultuous time for the industry, mm-hmm. um, how much of making the show is hanging out a shingle saying we at Showtime are open for radical business, that we are supportive mm-hmm. of creators like David Lynch, and we want to be thought of as the place that will, that will right. give you this creative freedom? Um, that's part of it, and that's an ancillary benefit of Twin Peaks, that it gives us cred in the extreme left edge of the, uh, of the art form. But that is, let's be clear, that is not my, sure. my goal. That's not, that's not what I live for. Um, and Twin Peaks has been a real demonstrable business success, uh, which is interesting. And I think it's a reflection of where the business is today and how our, um, business model works. Um, we, uh, Twin Peaks, I mean, simply stated, Twin Peaks drove a ton of subscriptions, way out of proportion mm-hmm. with the, the absolute size of its audience, um, which is a, just an interesting phenomenon. It brought a lot of people to, to uh, Showtime who are, were not watching Showtime, mm-hmm. and they have lasted um, the uh, um, 16 weeks that the show has been on uh, incredibly well, like at, at a higher proportion than you would expect. Um, so just in that, it's a business success, and now we are trying to transition those people who, who came in for, for, for Twin Peaks into other stuff. Can we get them into uh, The Affair? Can we get them into Ray Donovan? Can, can we get them into Billions? Um, and uh, I can see the ones we're succeeding with mm-hmm. and the ones we're not succeeding with, and the ones we're not succeeding with will probably churn out. The ones that we are succeeding with will probably uh, will stick. Um, but uh, it's an interesting show. It, you know, there's a feel to uh, Homeland, Shameless, Billions, Affair, Ray Donovan, Mm -hmm. um, where there's, they're very different shows, but they um, satisfy, you know, demographically are somewhat similar. Twin Peaks is completely other. Mm -hmm. Twin Peaks has lower total viewership than, uh, than those shows. Um, but it probably drove more subscription sign up activity mm-hmm. than any one of those shows alone. Um, and, uh, um, much higher proportion of twin peaks is viewed, uh, streaming wise. So when you look at the Sunday night, mm-hmm. that might be 10% of the total people who are going to watch it. Uh, if you look at just the Sunday night, Nielsen numbers, uh, linear numbers, um, might be 10%. Whereas with a normal show, you're going to probably get an average of about 20% 
in that first night Nielsen numbers of, of the people who will watch it over the course of the week. So it's just it's an interesting sort of outlier um, in terms of how it functions for us. Well, um, I, I also wouldn't want yeah. to, I don't want to do the job of your your internal um, divisions for you, but I but I also would think that some of the projects you have coming up that I'm I'm personally very interested in. You have Lena Waithe's show, The Shy, I think it's called, and you have mm-hmm. uh, Frankie Shaw's Smilf. I mean, these are shows that are uh, you're empowering. Storyteller, unique storytellers, and you know, I, I imagine that those shows are going to reflect their unique perspectives. And yeah, that, that that is a very thin strand of DNA, but an important one. You know, we're not saying right. that these shows are Twin Peaks. But when you talk about Lena Waite and the Shy, or um, Frankie Shaw and Smilf, and those are very clearly auteur TV, mm-hmm. um, and you know, particularly in the case of Frankie, where she's starring, writing, and directing it, so clearly based on her life. But it would be a mistake to not see uh, Homeland or The Affair as auteur TV. And you have writers and creators, Alex Gonza in the case of, of Homeland, or Sarah Treem in the case of The Affair, where it is as deeply um, personal and they have, you know, they are as in control of their medium, big picture and small picture as. David Lynch's in in uh, Twin Peaks. I wondered because the, the, one of the things about this, I, I think people who have only a casual relationship with his work, just when they think of the shorthand, what is David Lynch? They think, oh, weird, extremity, scary, sometimes. But what to me has always been is incredibly uh, stalwart and true emotionally and, and deeply emotional. And this show, not just because these are my these are my old friends in this world that I meant so much to me and still does, but. It's a very unique situation where you have Catherine Coulson, Miguel Ferrer, Warren Frost, yeah. Frank Silva, Donnie Davis, and David Bowie all contributing yeah. in ways, you know, uh, physical or otherwise to this. And the show honors all of them in a very beautiful way. Right. Um, it is an emotional I mean, I experience. think that, that is what makes the show so powerful. It is a very deep, deep reckoning with mortality. Yes. And, uh, um, and that is where I think so much of the emotional power comes from. And that doesn't that probably doesn't come from a 40-year-old artist. No. no. The, the, the 25 years are worn on the faces of people, and the show is very uh, unflinching but very respectful of that in a way that is, it, it, well, also yeah. being hilarious. I don't, I don't know that that really has much to do with your 25 years of fanboyness. I think that's um, that's in the show itself, and it's not just about your nostalgia. I don't think, I don't think um, nostalgia is the... Um, is the basis of that. I think it goes much deeper than that. I agree. Also, I, I think that now I qualify as a fan man, but I, but I, I but I think mm-hmm. you're, but I think you're correct. You, you mentioned, yes, I, uh... <laughs> you, you mentioned the Bowie scene. Um, before I let you go, is there any other, um, or just specifically as a fan yourself and obviously involved in it, any other character or moment um, that you just thrilled to that, that meant a lot to you that you were so excited to see, whether it is a, um, you know, someone that made a brief appearance uh, or, or a storyline well, that was of things that tied stick up. Out. There are a lot of things that stick out. The, uh, the Peggy Lipton kiss. Oh, so great. Um, the, uh, so, some of the scenes with Catherine Coulson, the log lady, mm-hmm. I, you know, uh, I was weeping at and the Bowie stuff. Um, I, I, um, there are two moments, two really specific moments coming up in the, uh, uh, and what you haven't seen that I'm looking forward to. Um, I, I, I guess this can't be for air, but I'll, I'll, I, I shouldn't. I, I would be mean to spoil it yeah, for you. No, but don't. Just, yeah, I won't. Okay. But I, let's, but, let's, let's, let's. but that's the beauty of the show. I just, I just don't yeah. want. I don't want to know. I just, I'm so excited. Right. I'm thrilling to it. Um, um, yeah, and then, and then funny stuff and creepy stuff, and you know, then of course, like there's just bug going in the mouth. I've relive that one over and over um it, just episode that, eight in general yeah. part eight in general i mean you you put that on your air it, it will be the shape of that the shape of that bug yeah which was half bug half amphibian uh to to be able to, to to be able to broadcast something that just cuts through everything else and speaks to people on a profound emotional level and everyone i think understood what that episode was the, the origins of mm-hmm. evil on a deep level but it never said that we just understand right. it, you know, and it, it was, it was right. something past, we think of television often as like a, just a machine for plot, and we're so far past that. I, I, I would think right. that 
that that, that would be a thrill just to be able to to know that you you know you, you had you put that on TV on a Sunday night in 2017, right. and that's 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 out there now. Um, well, I, I I'm just happy to have this chance to talk to you, David, and also hear that you are as uh, uh, moved and 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 uh, entertained by this as as all these diehards like myself are. Um, this this is the to my mind this is the show of the year, and you know maybe it, maybe it ends up being like the Velvet Underground albums where they weren't on the top of the charts, but everyone who listened to it formed a band. Let let's let's hope yep. because I think what you've done is it's not just a triumph artistically, but I think it's I think it's a, a triumph hopefully for the medium in a moment when it's getting you know un- unprecedented attention, but I think is still struggling to find the next phase creatively. Um, Past, right. well, past the difficult man. I was I was largely a bystander, but as they say, if you can't be an athlete, be a, be an athletic supporter. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you, whether whether you whether you whether you, you push the buttons or you uh, you yeah. put the people in the position to succeed, or you came back from vacation on time, you did something right, and you've earned yourself a, a, a an entire cherry pie when this whole thing is done. Excellent. Thank you, David. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks, Danny. Okay, that was it. That was my conversation with Showtime president and CEO David Nevins about the creation of Twin Peaks The Return. There's a couple weeks of it left. I promise I will get Chris to catch up and we will get back into it before this is done. It is the most meaningful television of the year to me. I think it's a total joy and a total trip. And of course, this is that's how it happened, right? Of course, David Lynch just said, hey, this is what we're doing, buddy, and I'm going to go do it. And David Nevins, who is in a, a, a well-respected, a veteran programmer and producer just had to say, yep. And that's kind of the attitude I, I have with Twin Peaks of the Return. You have to sit down on your couch. You have to put away your second screen and you just have to say, okay, yep. And it, it, it will reward you. Uh, thank you for listening to this episode of The Watch. Please remember to check us out this Sunday night live on Twitter, hashtag Talk the Thrones. We will be going live, me, Chris, Jason, Mallory, as soon as the East Coast airing of Game of Thrones season finale uh, ends. You can watch it live after East Coast and West Coast airings, streaming on Periscope. You can also follow, just follow us on Twitter, tweet out the links to watch it anytime. It's been a great season, uh, and it'll be, well, yeah, it's been a great season of Talk the Thrones for us. I think it's been an interesting season of Game of Thrones, and hopefully we'll end in a good place. Uh, and then uh, we'll be back next week with a podcast called The Watch and the Ringer Podcast Network. Great job, Baranskis. I'm saying it alone. There's no one else here. Bye. Bye.